Hey, thanks for joining us for Digging Deeper as we uh, look at the foundational belief of the inerrancy of Scripture. I want to revisit the Russell Moore quote from our sermon on Sunday, and I'm going to read that to you again. In his research study, Russell Moore had results uh, come up. He discovered results that basically gave him the freedom to make the statement um, and have it be accurate. And so here's that quote again. Young people are not leaving the church because they don't believe what the church teaches, but because they don't believe that the church believes what it teaches. Now, I know oftentimes we think of the idea of belief, the concept of belief in the terms of evangelism as trying to get someone to believe. But I think it's important for us to consider what it actually means to believe. And so I want to share a verse with you, um, a couple verses actually, from uh, Romans 10. Um, listen to this starting in verse 8 in Romans 10. <clears throat> but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and, and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. So think about that idea of the word believe in those verses. If you confess with your mouth, obviously, that's to speak something as an assertion of belief. And believe in your heart. That's where I think it gets interesting. <clears throat> that's where I think this quote by Russell Moore becomes relevant. Because the question for us then should become, what does it mean to believe in my heart? And so I want to go back to, a little bit to the... the uh, hesitate to use this word, but to the sociological view in the Hebrew culture of what constituted a human being. And so in the Hebrew culture, whereas we in a modern Western culture say the heart is the place where our emotions live and our mind is where knowledge is. And, and so when we talk about the mind, we tend to talk about knowledge. We talk about the heart, we tend to talk about feeling. Well, that wasn't necessarily true in a Hebrew culture, a Hebrew culture that, that Jesus grew up in and, and uh, came into, and a Hebrew culture that Paul was raised in, and, and Hebrew philosophy and ideas that he was weaned on as a rabbi, as a teacher. In that culture, the idea of heart conveyed the place where the will lived, where the desire lived, not where the emotions lived. And emotions in that culture were more in, similar in the Greek concept of where do emotions abide. Well, that's in the gut, even down to the point where if someone was having emotional issues in a classical Greek or Hebrew culture, they thought it was an issue of bile. They thought there were different colors of bile, and if they got imbalanced, you were you know, histrionic or melancholic or whatever it may be. But the reality is that when Paul says, believe in your heart, He's talking about a belief that resides in my willing and my desire. Now, take that idea, believe in your heart from Romans 10, confess with your mouth. I got to say it out loud. Believe with your heart. I have to will and desire to live as if this is true. Take those two concepts and hold on to them right here as I read this quote from Russell Moore one more time. Young people are not living are not leaving the church because they don't believe, okay, believe with the heart, that is they don't want and desire and will what the church teaches, but because they don't believe, okay, with the heart again, they don't believe, they don't have faith in, they don't want and desire and will that the church wants and desires and wills what it teaches. So think about that for a moment. People are looking at the church and saying, in your heart, the place where your will and your desire lives, we don't see what you confess with your mouth becoming a reality through your willing and desiring. Now, I'm going to take one more step into um, a philosophical type of realm, and it's with this. If we truly believe something with our heart, we will it and desire it, then would we not manifest that as a reality? Isn't that how 
Everything that we create and make as human beings in this world comes about. First, we desire it. Then we make it so. The, the, the desire of the heart, the belief of the heart is the thing that got the Wright brothers to look at a bird and say, we believe we can fly. We desire and will it in our hearts. So let's make it so. It's, it's the things that led to, you know, the, the engineers at Apple sitting down and going, we believe, we desire, we can create a device you can fit in your pocket and can carry all the information available to the, to the free world. And, and you can also make a phone call. And you can watch television on it. We believe we can make that. And that's how that came to be. They believed in their hearts. Everything that's ever been created, whether it's a building or, or landscaping or a, a product or a house or a vehicle or a paint color on a wall, all started as a willing and desiring in the heart that became manifest. And so when Paul tells us in Romans 9, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, there's an invitation there to live out what we profess to believe about Jesus. Now let's go back to Romans 10 one more time. Believe what in your heart? Well, if you believe in your heart that God raised him, him being Christ, from the dead. Now think about that for a minute. If my heart is my place of desiring and willing, and I believe in my heart, believe what? Believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, and by that I am saved, then would I not manifest a resurrection-type life in this world? If that's what I believe, if that's what I believe in the place where my desire and my will live, shouldn't that show up in how I live? Are we living as people who would say, well, yes, I must live this way because Christ has risen from the grave and through that I'm saved. Are we living as people who would say, well, of course I would want this thing and do this thing. Of course I'm going to love my neighbor. Of course I'm going to esteem others as more important than myself. Of course I'm not going to let any coarse language come out of my mouth. Of course I'm going to feed the hungry and I'm going to clothe the naked and I'm going to visit, visit those who are sick and imprisoned because I believe Christ was resurrected from the dead by God and that belief, that trust is my salvation. And so I want us to think in terms of what does it really mean to believe? Because if we have a concept of belief as something that lives in my head, where thoughts are, thoughts are not a component of the human being that can generate action on their own. There also needs to be desire. If I think I want to go to Spain for vacation, but I don't have a willing and a desire in my heart, I'm never going to do that. But we all have moments in our lives where our thoughts dangle out there somewhere, but they never become reality because they never move from a thought, an idea in my head, to a desiring of my heart. So if my thoughts are rooted in, yes, I believe and think that God rose Christ from the dead, that He came and died for my sins, and I am saved by that act, if I believe that in thought, but I never move it to a willing, a desiring of some type of life, then I'm never going to change how I live. And that quote from Russell Moore will then be true of me. That people will look at my life and leave the church or not be interested in the church or the message of the church, not because they don't think, they don't believe what the church is teaching, what I'm conveying, but because they don't think I believe it. And that goes back to the, the thing we briefly mentioned, uh, two ideas we briefly mentioned in the sermon. The first is this idea of conf confessional beliefs. You know what? A confessional belief is easy to make and it demands absolutely nothing of me. A convictional belief is a belief that I may confess or not confess, but you know that I believe it based on how I live. So at the risk of offending someone, I hope I don't, but at the risk of offending someone, I want to give you an example. If I professed belief in a flat earth and you came up to me and said, hey, I'm going to gift you a one year long around the world cruise and I'm going to pay all of your bills while you do it. 
Now, if I truly had the convictional belief that the earth was flat, the, that I've confessed as a confessional belief, chances are I'm not getting on a boat, no matter how enticing you make it, to go around the world. Because if that is my convictional belief, the one thing I believe is that I can't go around the world. I can only go to an edge of it and come back, but I can't go around it. But if that's a confessional belief and it's not a convictional belief, and you offer me the opportunity to sail around the globe, I'm probably going to take it. See, that's the thing. The church has spent a lot of time espousing our confessional beliefs. And nobody has an issue with that for the most part. You know, we live in a culture now where people just say, believe what you believe and live in it. Nobody, it used to be 30, 40, 50 years ago, people were standing up and saying, how can you believe that? How can you believe that? Well, we live in a culture now that basically says, say what you believe and believe it and nobody cares. It doesn't change anything for anybody else. We've become so um, relative and humanistic that nobody wants to challenge anybody's belief on anything. As an example, see questions around things like gender in our culture today. But if I confess a belief and I live it as a convictional belief, then people may take issue with it because I'm living as if what I say is true. That's where we have to step up as the church. Maybe it's time for us to go, yes, confessional beliefs are good and I need to state my confessional beliefs, but I need to understand this that underlying every confessional belief that I state should be a convictional belief that others can see lived out in my life. That's the challenge. That's, that's the idea of belief in your heart that Paul talks about in Romans 10. If I believe in my heart, then guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to begin to act as if what I confess with my mouth, that Jesus Christ is Lord, is actually true. So then I live as if Jesus Christ is Lord. So what does that mean in the short term? It means that every standard to judge my behavior, to set the template of how I'm going to act, to make decisions of what I'm going to do, is rooted in the confessional belief that Jesus Christ is Lord, and then I invite the Holy Spirit into the process of living out the convictional belief of actually obeying Him as Lord living a life that says He is Lord and glorifies Him. So I hope that makes sense. I know there's a lot of stuff in there, and I hope it's not um, a bunch of edges of threads that can't be tied together in your discussion, but um, I really want us to press into this idea of if this is a convictional belief in my life, how am I living it out? So I just want to leave you with a prayer and invite you to have a great, open, and, and um, community-building time in your discussion. And those uh, questions that Pastor James gave us this week are a fantastic place to start. Let me pray for you. Father, we're so grateful that you have placed before us the not only the opportunity to live as if Jesus is Lord, but also the power to do it through your Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And God, I pray that we first as temple and then as Christians around the globe become people who live out what we profess to believe, that we live it out of our heart, we believe in our hearts to the degree that it becomes our primary desiring and our ultimate willing and it manifests itself in actions and words and deeds and love for you and for our neighbors. And we just ask that you would do that in us through this time of conversation and question together in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks and have a great discussion time in your group.